Welcome to Mock It. Liz is a user experience strategist turned project manager committed to human-centered driven approaches and results. She has worked on 20 plus higher education, government, and client-facing websites and software platforms, creating long-lasting user-focused digital solutions. Liz is devoted to equity and strives to celebrate diversity and inclusion in the industry and beyond. Marie is a former visual designer turned agile loving human-centered design advocate. They have helped government organizations for almost a decade build successful digital products by aligning cross-functional teams around a deep understanding of the user at the heart of their mission. Marie is passionate about improving user experiences while achieving business objectives in harmony. They are also a strong advocate for women in STEM. Hi, I'm Marie, and that's Wilson, and this is Mock It, a podcast sponsored by MetroStar, where we take a deep dive look into UX design, training design topics, and chatting with our friends in the field. Let's get started. So today, you'll notice um, that's Wilson and not Liz. Um, Liz is away with her family on a much-deserved vacation, and Wilson is going to join us as a special co-host. Um, we've wrangled him in since the last episode. Um, and with us today is Travis Oliphant. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Great to be here. Nice. Um, so Wilson, do you want to just give a brief run through of what you do at Metro Star 2? Sure. Um, so thanks for having me on also again, uh, yeah. round two. So I'm a senior data scientist here with Metro Star, work um, on a lot of government problems uh, using open source uh, Python data science technologies um, with a particular focus in computer vision. And um, anyone that's curious about more of that can check out the previous episode. But the short story is, uh, you know, computer vision is just how uh, computers interact with images in the form of math that lets us have cool Snapchat filters and things like that. But, right, or she hulks yeah, yeah, earlier today. Yes, I did make a she hulk. <laughs> and then for today's guest on our episode, um, which I should probably say the title is um, The Age of Human-Centered AI and the Race to Ethical AI and ML and How Do We Trust, How Do We Grow to Trust It, um, is Travis Oliphant. Um, so we're super excited to talk with you today. Um, you are one of the most impactful programmers and data scientists of this generation. Um, Travis is also a CEO of Open Teams and Quonsite and the founder of Anaconda and the creator of NumPy, Sci-Fi, and number? Is that how you say it? Okay, cool. Um, welcome, Travis. Do you want to, you know, let our guests know? I mean, you're our guest. Our <laughs> viewers know a little bit more about you. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. Uh, no, great introduction. I mean, I'm, I'm flattered. I, I think uh, I've had the chance to sort of witness uh, the emergence of open source as a foundation of AI and ML and just met a ton of great people in that journey and, and helped a little bit along the way. Uh, so I love connecting open source communities to uh, the company need, that needs them and really help the sustainability of open source. That's a passion of mine. And AI, um, I'm, I'm a mathematician by training. So I love, I've been, I was doing machine learning before they called it AI and ML. It was uh, inference problems and inverse problems. And okay. and it was, it was actually, we couldn't usually use deep learning very much because compute was too high and the data was too big and we couldn't, you know, we, the machines needed to grow and the, and the processing power needed to grow. So, but I've been really pleased to watch the work we've done in Python to make Python accessible to scientists, engineers, and uh, regular people who know math. And a lot of those people started to use it to do deep learning and to kind of these, and, and it's amazing what's happened over the past five to 10 years that has really started to blow my mind and blow a lot right. of other people's minds. Not a lot so of we're time. we're excited about it. Right. Um, can you, do you mind stepping back and explaining what open source means? Sure. Yeah. Open source is a, it's kind of become a little bit of a buzzword, but it's a code. It's a, it, it means a lot of things, to different people, okay. but fundamentally it's, you can see the source code. So when you write a computer program, um, there's different kinds of programs, but typically computers actually just see ones and zeros. They need, they need bits and, and it's instructions. It's pretty intense. Like the early programmers that help us get to the moon, you know, they wrote, assembly code, like ones and zeros mm -hmm. and machine instructions. So it didn't really matter whether it was open or not. Nobody could read it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as, as programming languages got more mature, like Python, C, C++, they get higher level. Now all of a sudden, you know, 
you want to see what the computer is doing. You want to see the code behind it. Mm-hmm. And so open source was, you know, as people are selling their code, they don't really want to make the source code available. They don't want you to see it because they want to be able to sell you the code. Right. And if you make it open source, then it's easier to copy it, easier to make your own. So there's been this, there was a tension for a while, but about in the nineties and 2010, over the past 20 years, open source has become to dominate everything. It's so it's so much more productive for engineers to learn from each other's code. Mm-hmm. And people, I, I was one of those engineers that loved to participate in open source communities. And I loved the the camaraderie, the sharing, the what I could learn from other smart people and what I could try to contribute myself. Um, so open source means you can see the source code and therefore you can do what you, what you like with it typically. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of nuance around that, but that's the basics. Uh, no, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. and to put that in context of why that's like so important yeah. in industry is uh, that also means that when it's open source to the public, the public can also contribute back to that. So, you know, rather than having, in some cases, it is still a handful of people that support it, but, you know, people theoretically are able to take a look into it, figure out ways to improve it and collective, it provide almost a collective impact on that area. Um, and so that's, that's something that's particularly special as well. Whereas proprietary solutions, that company is the only one that's ever going to touch it. Uh, this way, you know, theoretically everybody could work on it. Cool. So I was just thinking, so it's like transparency in the code. Does that, I don't know if it matters within your fields. Um, but so like within the government, right. To build trust back in the government, there's been a big thing about transparency, does this oh, yeah. help with that Absolutely. as well? Yeah, I think that's one of the big reasons people, particularly we start talking about AI and ML, mm-hmm. I think transparency is going to be a must. Now, here in this case, it's not the code that's the only thing that matters. We can get into that a little bit later. Because yeah. a lot of times the code is used to train a model. Then the model can be closed or open. You know, you can basically just have some uh, numbers that make up a model. And if it's not, you don't have access to those numbers, you don't know how it was trained. There's a lot of more things to think about when you think about open. It's not enough to say, oh, we used open source PyTorch to do this training. Cool. It's all good. Well, maybe not. not maybe fully. there's some things not fully, right? <laughs> yeah. But I absolutely agree that it can really help with transparency. That's certainly one reason a lot of people like to adopt open source. It gives them awareness of, oh, I know where this is coming from. Cool. Is it, let me like get into the weeds. Like, could I go and look at it and like sure. work yeah. on a model and- yeah, make it, some she hulks of yeah. What's really <laughs> interesting, I think, is it basically is very um, not only transparency but accessibility. Yeah, like you don't have to go to a special school, you don't have to go to a, a, a special club. Anybody can go look at code. Now it's it's work to learn that language yeah. and, and understand and make a contribution. And then there is a difference between um, I've I've coined the term company backed versus community driven open source company backed open source. And they're both reason they're they're both useful, but they're different in the sense. If you have a company backed open source project, you want to contribute to it. There are going to be rules set by that company and maybe, or maybe not, you can contribute. Okay. Community driven. The only rules are typically, are you able to contribute? Like, do your peers think that your contributions are worth being pulled in? Right, like you don't have a lot of bugs in your contributions. Yeah, bugs, are you useful? But but it takes some time. I mean, I would, anybody trying to do this, I would give yourself like 18 months to three years. Don't assume you're gonna go one weekend and make some code contributions and then everyone's gonna adopt your stuff. (laughs) It usually takes, but but I've seen numerous times, even as three months to 18 months, people become deeply integrated into a project. But they started, they didn't, nobody knew them. Over a period of time, now they're the chief maintainer. Now they're in charge of that project, basically. Awesome. So it's very accessible. That's great. And I know you've mentioned. Um, I'm not sure what episode it was that I watched before um, you coming on, but talking about um, those contributors getting more recon- recognition. Um, is that what like they would you be able to get recognized? Like you said, like you spend some time in it in the community driven ones. Yeah, yeah, and you could get recognized in company backed as well. Okay. It's just it's a little more nuanced in terms of how that looks, and you may want to get hired by that company or not. Now, now there's a, there's a more to say about all of that, but the community driven ones, which I know a lot about, and I know about the other ones as well. I've done company sponsored projects too, but community driven, yes. Like, why does it exist? I mean, yeah. People do it for a lot of reasons. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a joy in sharing with people. Like yeah. we're, we're, we're wired to be tribal. We, we like our communities, our friends. And a lot of times you become friends. This is your family. There's your group of people you're sharing with. Mm-hmm. It's very, it's very enriching actually. It's very helpful. So people do it for that reason, but then they, you do get known. You're, oh, I'm, I'm a maintainer of this open source project and put that on your resume. 
you actually don't have to put it in your resume. Typically, people know that you're doing that because they see you on GitHub and people are scouring <laughs> GitHub trying to find talented people. And so you typically get contacted just oh. by making contributions. So fascinating. In fact, Learning to a point so where some people are some people are kind of trying to game that a little bit. I would mm. not suggest this because it's really easy to detect. Yeah. And, and then you kind of get on a blacklist. Yeah, right. And, and people are trying that. to we're trying to game it like, oh, I'll make a quick change to a spelling word or I just want to get a commit committed to that project so I can be seen as a contributor, but it wasn't doing anything. I was like, meaningful, yeah. it wasn't meaningful. Right. Yeah. And so some people have tried that approach just thinking, Oh, all I got to do is get my name on GitHub and a few yeah. projects and I'll be famous or I'll get a job. I don't know what the intent is, honestly, but it's really quite easy to detect. Yeah. Some kind of recognition. So yeah. But so you have to guard against that temptation a little bit, but there's, tons of opportunity to do meaningful things and meaningful things could be, I fixed a documentation string. Mm -hmm. You know, I improved this example. Um, there's lots of places to start. You don't have to start by going, I rewrote the entire kernel engine of PyTorch. Like you don't have to do that. You can just <laughs> make something simpler. Awesome. So, um, I know we've, got, I like took us down the road about the open source and the code. Uh, but to bring us back a little bit, um, so a lot of people know about AI and ML from like the self-driving cars. Uh, now uh, chat GPT has brought it into the headlines a lot more. Um, when did you decide that AI had the potential to really impact the world? Oh, I think it was, it was, I mean, AI is a extension of ML, which is machine mm -hmm. learning and machine learning has been impacting the world for 40, 50 years. Like, so I would say as soon as I understood how, uh, data works. So yeah. probably by the time I was 29, 20, 30, I could see, Oh, this has a lot of potential. It's just a matter of how I think the deep learning, the ability for deep learning to really have this, um, emergent effects that are kind of bigger than what you can derive you know, chat GBT. I wouldn't have predicted uh, two years ago. I wouldn't have predicted that. Oh wait, I can talk to this computer and it can give me, it can sound like, you know, my, my, intern, right. Yeah. I think it can give me code back. I'm like, that's, that's a bit surprising to me. It was a, it was a bit, um, so I, I didn't, I, I knew theoretically that could happen within 20 years, but it's kind of ahead of the, ahead of the curve for me, but you could see that yeah, AI was having an impact probably 10 years ago. You could see was as the GPUs were emerging and the data centers were emerging, the cloud was reemerging, the, the fact that people had a lot of data they were gathering. So when we started Anaconda as a company in 2012, I could see the impact that machine learning would have. Um, what's a, like, I don't know how to phrase this, like a real world scenario of like how machine learning has been helping us that like an any day person may not have realized that it was machine learning was behind it. Uh, credit scores, okay. <laughs> you know, basically, I mean, credit scores are you're predicting whether they should give you a loan. Yeah. Like people have been using machine learning to predict whether they should get a loan for a long time. And so this is actually where some of the first, um, you know, the questions of bias comes in. Okay. Right. You know, in, in fact, it's kind of a lot of people who start doing machine learning analyses on, on loans, should I give loans? It kind of comes down to demographics, actually. It kind of comes down to, well, if you live in a part of town that has money, then maybe I'll loan you money. If you live in a part of town that doesn't have money, maybe I won't. Uh, but, but that can actually have quite a bit of bias in it. And so people, you know, there's actually been intentional work to not use certain, like, for example, a machine learning model might tell you, oh, just use zip code as a basis for, yeah. for credit. For, for granting loans and they, you can't do that. That's actually illegal. So there's, yeah, been, there's been laws there's passed to prevent that. Issues, this is yeah. the first place where we saw this, okay, these machine learning models can have biases that we don't want, but credit scores, you know, get, whether they should get a loan or not. Absolutely. Nice. That was really good. Connecting the dots for <laughs> all of us, not deep in ML and AI. Um, so you really are going to transition us well into ethical AI um, and machine learning. How do you explain to others, like, what is it? How do you try to build trustworthy AI? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go make a go at it, but I'd love to other, have other perspectives too. Wilson, I know you probably have some experience here too. Sure. Um, I mean, what I feel like ethical and trustworthy AI really revolves around at the end of the day is trying to ensure that the things that we're building are helping people. Uh, and that typically can be reduced down to the impact that they have. and uh, what the information that goes into it, is that valid? You know, are we avoiding any undue biases or anything of that? Are, are we taking into account some of these edge use cases that, you know, even if it's only happening 5% of the time, you know, 
is it significant enough of an impact that that still needs you know some sort of uh, recognition? Then, as we take a step back and we start to think about more black box techniques like deep learning, where it's not quite as human interpretable, and we have to start to explain why an answer was given, like uh, what you were talking about around the zip codes, for example. If there were some inputs that had some unknown biases, how do we go back and trace that answer back until we surface something that? may exist in the data that we didn't know existed before. Maybe we can find something that um, that will contribute to us improving our process further moving forward. Um, so really, the idea of, uh, at least in my personal opinion, around ethical and trustworthy AI is being able to go back and, even if it's black box, we can make that a little more gray box and understand maybe what made us lean towards answer B rather than answer A. Yeah. What One principle about understanding the model um, every model can be understood with enough compute power, but it takes a lot. Like, so one of the challenges we have right now is we have some really impressive AI models that take a lot of compute power to train and it can take up to like 10 X that compute power to understand. And the way you just generally how you'd understand it is doing sensitivity analyses, right? So the compute power and then the data set. So if we're pushing the envelope with, we're using all the data and all the compute power, just to get the model, then there's sort of none left to figure out whether it's, you know, what it means and what it, what it says. But if you, but you know, as things grow and you have a smaller model, then you can kind of, Oh, I can use more compute power to understand the sensitivity to kind of help explain. Um, Cause that's really how we're going to get to trust it. I think is when it becomes like the first stages of modeling is like right now it's, it's, it's going to be hard to trust some of this. So the best applications of the most complicated, but impressive models are where it's exciting, but not, you don't depend on it. Okay. Right, where it's kind of like, oh, here's a really cool thing that I was otherwise just going to use an um, intern or a or you know, or, or, or to teach somebody, or, or I was going to have to review it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll let the AI produce something for me to review. It really isn't ready to kind of just be, you know, like a medical AI is a great, great example. We you have you have AIs that can do as good a job right now of screening for cancer or mm -hmm. detecting as radiologists, but nobody's comfortable with having the machine do it. But when I think what will happen over the next decade, certainly maybe even half a decade, is people will start to w want their doctor to actually have also consulted an AI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'll want to know is it, is part of this team a, a machine that's done, you know, it's given you given you a, that has all that data that, has all that, that it's data. like look through too. Right. right. So we're not going to be comfortable just just having the machine. But I think we'll want kind of a machine uh, a, a person a machine a person augmented by the machine. You know, aug augmented intelligence, actually what I say AI really should mean, because yeah. it's not about the artificial side that we're going to be really resonating, even for, at least for the next 50 years, it's going to be augmented intelligence. Yeah. Really, how, how do we become better using these uh, powerful machine models? Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, and I think both of you touched on it, the explainability of the results of the model. Um, I think so. That right is helpful from, especially like if you're getting your medical diagnosis, which I read about that yesterday, um, that people are like, they want the models to show like why in this case was like the result B and then in this other case was D, like what was that difference um, for whatever reason. But I like the addition of like the doctors being augmented, mm -hmm. but that's a really, it's like really cool. Cause I was like, yeah, I don't know about if I would just like go online and be like, oh, their little model told me this, like when I went to go check into my health portal, like where's my call from the doctor <laughs> from like the human that's like, you know, telling you whatever your results are. Um, so I find it interesting with human centered design and how we build trust within our digital products or anything, um, right? Cause you can use human centered design for like building a city. Um, the big thing right now is the co-collaborating with who you're making it for. Or um, so within our industry, the policies that policyholders are going and co-collaborating with who they're going to impact. Is there a way um, in AI and ML to go co-collaborate with who the model is for, like with the doctors? If we just stay on the medical side of it. My, mm -hmm. through maybe an maybe you can go into more detail. Like, this is <laughs> I, this is this sort of concept is new, but like, I think I know what you're talking about. But maybe you could maybe uh, describe what you mean by the co-collaboration. Yeah. So. Um, like, can the data scientists, like, would you guys go and work with doctors to find out how to better, like, train your model, program your model to meet their needs? 
it would probably be less around like uh, programming the model, but to your point, um, yeah. consulting subject matter experts, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Like I have a friend who's, uh, he works in biotech and uh, he has his PhD in biotechnology. Um, and his entire job is working alongside data scientists to mm -hmm. do research on, you know, um, I forget the microorganisms. Um, and the so, mold guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, yes. not that your friend is the mold guy. The <laughs> mold that we talked about in the last episode. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so working closely with the subject matter experts, you know, he's an expert in biotech. He's working with data science who are experts in data science. As I trip over myself, uh, he's working <laughs> with data scientists who are experts in data science. Um, and through their collaboration, he's able to label the data, tell them, you know, what to, you know, what outliers, what features are likely important. Um, and then, of course, there's further exploration done by the models, algorithms, what have you that mm -hmm. we're building on our end. Um, but yeah, absolutely. As far as uh, working with SMEs and subject matter experts, yeah. In fact, like the whole concept there is a there's a concept called subject matter expert, yeah. which is very prevalent in the industry precisely because of this. Like nobody pretends that their data scientist is going to be able to do something on their own. Okay. They're, they're, they really are. You're going to require awareness of that of that um, expert to understand the data because ultimately the model is what you what data you feed it mm -hmm. like. Deep learning, there are many kinds of deep learning. There's unsupervised or supervised, but the most common, you have to have a lot of trained data, right? And who labels those data? Like you gotta have somebody out there who yeah. said, here's the example of what I'm looking at. Here's the, here's the image that shows cancer and this is labeled cancer and this is not labeled cancer. And you have to have the subject matter expert aware of that or you can get really weird really weird results. Like here's a, an example from the medical industry where basically the, the machine learning model was extremely accurate at predicting results on the training data set. But it ended up, if you, they looked into, well, what's going on? Because it was kind of failing in the real world. And they looked at the, the result, and it was basically the machine learning model was zeroing in on the words at the bottom of the x-ray scan about where that was taken. Because oh. there was bias in the data set that, yeah. that, that the, the cancer patients came from this one hospital, and the other patients didn't. And so the machine learning model had basically made a model yeah. to predict where which hospital they came <laughs> from by looking at the words in yeah. that because that's the that's the strength of these modern deep learning models is they kind of can take your data and they'll build a model. Mm -hmm. They don't have to know about anything else except just what's what am I trying to predict? Yeah. And they can do it with if there's anything in the data, but you can have these situations where wait. It learned from the wrong learned, thing. It <laughs> not from the, the actual X-ray. <laughs> okay, that's not what we're looking for. Yeah. But that could happen. Oh man, things to learn. Yeah. Um, so is there like a checklist like to avoid, to potentially try to avoid something like that from happening the next time you make a model? You, you have to recognize that the step to production okay. is, is sometimes to be monitored yeah. and, and managed. I mean, there's already, you know, that we separate into trust, test and training, the data set you have, but even still that wouldn't have, that example I showed wouldn't have when have caught it, you only catch it when you go to production. So kind of model, model management is a concept. Like you have to recognize I have a model and it has a, and it has, it's gotta be managed because lots of, if things change, mm -hmm. I don't, if I don't know what my model and the explainability, model model management, explainability are two concepts. You have to really be part of your model story. It's not okay. enough to say, Oh, I got this amazing black box that said X. <laughs> yeah. Cool. <laughs> now you've got another <laughs> problem, which is what is, what is that? You know, how accurate is that still? Has the data changed? Because even if it's wonderful now, what if it's tying into scanners and a particular scanner changes and now you're missing something? So a lot of times there's there's a lot of a lot of opportunity for questions, for improving things, but you gotta pay attention. So we're gonna need for at least my lifetime and probably my children's lifetime, attentive subject matter experts. In fact, I think the whole machine learning um what it's doing is it's not it's not gonna it's definitely gonna put some kinds of jobs out, like they won't be needed anymore, but it's going to amplify the number of other kinds of jobs, the human centered jobs that are needed. Yeah. And so I think there's a, it's definitely going to be disruptive, but it's going to actually provide more opportunity to do more interesting kinds of things. I think it's going to augment it. Right? It's going to augment. Yeah. Exactly. So be somebody who can <laughs> use that machine model. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and it's, and it's accessible. That's the cool thing is you don't actually have to be an expert in math and, and the, and the physics and the, uh, and the, detailed linear algebra or the GPU computational details of to make a model, you don't. You just have to understand a little bit about what it means and how do I just like 
people can use computers, even though people don't know how to make them. Yeah. Right. Same thing here. You'll be able to use models, even though you don't know how to build them necessarily. Mm -hmm. You can use, and you can learn about them. You can know about them, how they work. Cool. Yeah. I feel like, so, um, Wilson and I have been working together on a project and I like when I first joined, cause it's a AI, is it all AI ML? Is this, uh, the whole Onyx side of the house? Yeah. Or? Yeah. So it's uh, the machine learning platform that yeah. we've been working with. So I'd be like, I was YouTubing like videos of like machine learning for dummies. You know, like remember those old yellow yes, books of yes, like, yes. like how to use a computer for a dummy. <laughs> yes. um, and that was like my go-to search to start in the yeah, beginning. It's great. We're um, all dummies in something. So <laughs> yeah, you got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, just to learn how to ask the question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great point. Did you have, you want to add anything about... Um, your checklist for your AI models? No, I mean, I think um, Travis made really solid points where um, a lot of the things that you'll find out about your model's bias, because um, at the, you know, when, when we're building the experiment, it can be really difficult, especially if we're working with larger data sets to go in and investigate at a more granular level um, what kind of biases exist because you, you can surface some like common ones, uh, but they may be ones you already know about and they may actually be almost, you know, features where, uh, you know, for example, if you're training an algorithm to say whether someone's walking or running um, for, based off a of picture, it may look for straight lines versus blurry lines. Mm -hmm. And that would be surfaced as, you know, a difference between the two, but you know, that's a feature. Um, so when we're looking at, Maybe what else influences that, um, to Travis's point, going back and looking at the model once it's been trained and making sure that it's honing in on the things that do matter versus doesn't like, you know, maybe the running versus walking, it says, is this person wearing running shorts? And it's like, uh, well, you sure that might be correlated, but it's not, you know, the thing that Definite, it should be. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's where the explainability models will help because with that, they, they found, figured out that it was training on that, um, letters. Yeah. By looking at the weights that were coming off, they had a, it was a, you know, the, the detailed way it took the picture and then produced weights for the models. There were a whole lot of zeros, right? Which meant it was ignoring most of the image. And that's what, <laughs> wait a minute, how was it giving me a prediction with not looking at the data in the image? Yeah. So you, you, there are some heuristics and things you can do if you, and you don't have to be an expert to kind of try to like, wait, this doesn't make sense. How do I have all zeros in my model? <laughs> And, and yet it's doing this thing that's making a prediction. Like if it doesn't make sense, it probably isn't there's probably a problem. Yeah. Something right? gotta so, go check. Right. Exactly. So, you know, just being aware that problems like that can occur and not assuming that everything's okay. I think that's one big thing is it's actually, it's an opportunity for more attentiveness, not less. Um, as we go into a world where a lot will be provided, I mean, you know, it won't be very long before we have uh, robot assistants, right? I mean, you, like a Jarvis you yeah. see Iron Man. Right. And you look at the chat GPT combine chat GPT with a self-driving robot in your house. Right. So weird. And you're going to have, well, I, actually the thing, weird I was, but cool. the thing I was thinking about is actually probably pets. Yeah. Right. Like I bet you'll have a, uh, you know, a, a companion, a home <laughs> companion because basically making modeling why, you know, we have a dog, we actually lost our dog uh, oh, two, two weeks ago. It was really, really sad. We loved her. She's so amazing. My daughter was really, really broken up about it. And so did my wife, actually, we're all, we're all sad, but it did cause me to think a little bit, wait, could you create a cuddly artificial <laughs> element that reproduced that? I know a lot of people that will hate me for saying that, but, yeah. but like people who though have like <sighs> pet allergies, it might be great for exactly. them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. You could probably simulate a lot of this. Yeah. So I, I don't know. But then, right, like, my words, nobody but. worry. We don't have to, like, make any donations after this episode. <laughs> no, no, no. Nothing. Real life <laughs> I'm just trying to think. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Again. Correct. I'm just trying to think what's going to happen in yeah. the future. And But it's not something to be afraid of. Yeah. Because I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of dystopian views about that. Mm -hmm. Because it's actually, I'm a real proponent of open models. And open, I, I don't want to see a world where there's one company that produces all of our AI models. Like, that would be a bad outcome. Right. Yeah, there, oh, there really that's should like be what nightmares are made yeah, out of exactly. <laughs> blockbuster movies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I think we have, we're, we're really well positioned for that not to happen. Yeah. There's so much knowledge out there already. And we just have to keep ensuring that we, that people stay attentive and, and, and be um, innovative. Like don't, don't be afraid to jump in and do something. It's never been a bigger opportunity out there than to create new things and new models and new ideas. Um, so I'm really excited for the future. Um, Thinking about that, like on the accessibility aspect, um, and I don't know why my brain went this way. Um, 
So we, we talk about like, great, the digital space is so awesome. I mean, I've appreciated it as a parent, how many times like I could continue my son's education through the pandemic or if kid just doesn't bring home his study guide, I can like go Google whatever his grade is in that topic and we can make do. Um, but with all that, there is uh, like a separation that happens from those who don't have access to technology. Yes. Um, I guess, do you have thoughts on that? Like, uh, right, the biggest population that's affected by the lack of technology is homeless. Yeah, um, you're right. That actually divide will grow. There's a potential for that to grow even bigger. Yeah. Right, we've seen that already. You know, and um, yeah, that is a, that is a, a something to be look at and see how you can, uh, you know, what what can be done. I think the more people that can help that, the more the more programs that can exist. It like I think about just countries too. Like yeah. right, right now, we have a, a company called Open Teams Global. Where I'm actually looking all over the world for talent because it's in Africa, it's in Bangladesh, it's in Philippines, and and open source really enables people who may not have an infrastructure. Maybe they don't have but they do have power. They do have uh, internet, right? Even if the internet's over 5G, you know, on, on cell phones, it's still not bad and you can actually contribute to this world. So even in this case, I think that this, demo this demo democratic access to models, to modeling, to creation can help, but we do have to be vigilant about how is this actually playing out? Because actually internet too, they call it, surprised me a little bit. Like when, when internet came out, like we we're all super excited by the ability to share web pages. People could put up a web page, you could do everything you wanted. Then you fast forward 20 years and it's like, oh wait, the internet's being controlled by a few companies, yeah. a handful of companies. And all of a sudden you have the ability for these companies to shut down flow of communication. It's like, this is not the world we imagined would happen. So, and, you know, there's, of course, there's distributed web and web three and people are trying to overcome that and do different things. But it's unclear what's going to happen. So I think it is important to look and say, Hey, what's, how is this being utilized? Yeah. You know, who's using it? But I, I love like a lot. What you want is a lot of companies. Yeah. A lot of people have access to a divergent set of, of capabilities. Uh, <laughs> so, something that's also, uh, you know, great is um, something that was mentioned earlier around the uh, access to cloud compute resources. There are uh, very available tool sets like Google Colab. Um, I think Paperspace has some very affordable cloud compute as well, uh, where people can take advantage of very low cost resources. Uh, there are free training tools on YouTube, things of that nature. Um, and of course, again, all of that doesn't matter if you don't have access to the internet and a computer. Um, luckily, internet is becoming more and more available to people through things like uh, 5G, as well as uh, you know satellite internet that's becoming more prevalent. Um, but there are also very cheap compute resources that are out there, such as like Raspberry Pi, for example, extremely small scale, small form factor, um, compute resources where people can connect to those cloud resources to start to learn those new techniques and things of that nature. Um, but, you know, there are of course the, the limitations in, you know, socioeconomically where it's like, you know, do you have the time and access to be able to do those things? Um, but hopefully programs like that will at least stem that divide a little bit. But, you know, I also agree though, that as people, you know, as, as time goes on, um, hopefully we continue programs like that. Um, and hopefully that divide doesn't quite grow as much as it possibly could. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I just, right. You can tell. Human centered designer over here, always thinking about the people. <laughs> um, uh, when you guys were mentioning that about the access and that, right there, there is a lot. Um, there was an article recently about, I think it's New York public schools are not having, or no, is it the public schools or the university aren't having chat uh, GB, G, GPT? Yeah. yeah. I don't know why I always want to say P in there. Um, it's not accessible on their school issued computers or maybe even over the network unless, you know, they fill out a form is like, I'm studying AI technologies. Um, what are your thoughts on that? The like controlling access to different AI models? Yeah, maybe you can help me understand. I don't know what the, I didn't read that article. So sure. I think it's uh, to stem like uh, plagiarism and Oh, the, things the, the, the school said, we're not gonna allow access to this. Yeah, yeah the school uh, said, yeah. so I was like, I saw recently like they're trying to watermark um, AI created content, written content. Um, and then also the school is limiting because um, they think it's 
going to inhibit um, critical thinking skills and problem solving skills if I can like, I don't even know how it works. I haven't been on it yet, but like, right, type in like a few keywords about what I want it to write for me. Yeah, there's real questions. I, my yeah. my son, you know, I just saw ChatGPT probably a month ago. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I wasn't kind of an early adopter, but I was uh, maybe a month ago and I showed it to my kids and my son, you know, he basically put in the prompt for the essay he had just written, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. write me an essay on Jane Eyre and uh, the origins of Jane Eyre and how that related to her story. Came back this essay. He's looking at that, going, "I could have submitted this. This is great." <laughs> now he had already submitted his essay. Yeah. So and you he, would, he, you've, you've raised him right too. Like. <laughs> right. No, he wouldn't have. He wouldn't have done that. Then I, I uh, but but very quickly I, I noticed that he was he had logged in, got himself a chat GPT, and yeah, they do he was all quick. of a sudden very interested. <laughs> Wait, this could help me tomorrow. <laughs> I have another weird essay. So I, I understand the the concern people have. I don't, I don't claim to know everything. I, I will, I, there's usually, it is usually advisable to be a little bit uh, cautious, I think. I've been really concerned about like my kids playing too much video games, right, for mm -hmm. example. But actually, you know, their time in Minecraft has actually helped their brains develop pretty well. Like yeah. I have a son that was deep into video games. It's actually helped him understand how to map complex ideas and, and interact with people. So sometimes we, we think we know what the impact's gonna be and we actually don't. You know, Socrates didn't want people to learn to write. He was really concerned about literacy, for example. Okay. He was very concerned about literacy because, you know, then back in the day, people would memorize and recite. They had a long oral tradition. The Odyssey was spoken. It wasn't yeah. written. And he correctly recognized that when people write, they won't do that anymore. And we don't. We, we rely on our writing, right? Yeah. And, you know, Google, like we don't, like, do we, I can't do index cards anymore. I don't worry about having a collection of information in my library. I just go and search on the internet. Just have like a million tabs just open. Have a million tabs open, right? <laughs> I would so, never. No. I don't, so I don't know. I'm not sure if it'll, I mean, yeah, potentially, but there's also a potential that will kind of grow into a world where, yeah, you're going to have this AI assistant to help you formulate your thoughts. Right. You can basically like a little, a little uh, Watson. Everybody has, every Sherlock has their Watson. Every person is a Sherlock has their Watson. They yeah. can just, what do you think about this? And kind of help formulate your thinking better. So it's, more like an additional like skill that you're learning, right? On yes. top of critical thinking, right? Like how do I how do I talk? Right? How do I talk? How do I what augment questions do I ask? my stuff? Yeah, with well, that because the questions you ask will matter. Mm -hmm. Like what you get out of ChatGPT is highly dependent on how you say the question and what you ask it, and so you can get better results. So I don't know. There's I, I, I can appreciate, and I think I certainly think being able to detect. And I don't. I'm not an advocate for people just submitting essays. And I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> yeah. looking at. Oh man, if I were reading essays, I'd be wary of this, right? Yeah, now where it's like a new concern. <laughs> It'd be a new have. concern, and I and it's legitimate. Yeah. So and it may be that like oral education also plays more of a role. Who knows? You know, moving mm. forward, where it's you know instead of submitting a ten page essay, oh, right. have a ten minute conversation. Ten minute conversation. That's oh, a that. really good point. Yeah. I had a professor that did that for the far final, yeah. Our, yeah. our physics final. He just came in and sat with us, and he talked to us for twenty minutes. That's so funny that you yep. bring that up. So I used to coach high school sports, and the way that I could really tell if my girls were getting it was not how much I was speaking to them, but having them now teach the skill to their teammates. Uh, so it's yeah. the same concept, yeah. right? Like it wasn't in one ear, out one ear. They have to stop and process it. So same thing, right? You could, great. Thanks for that Just paper. Talk. Let's see if we can like actually have a conversation, have a conversation. about this. Like, yeah, now let's have, now let, you know exactly. And I think that maybe just changed our, our assessment approach, Yeah. right? It's no longer we're not assessing your, what you produced here. We're assessing your communication or how you talk about it. Yeah. Interesting. Could also help, right? Because now there's communication issues with all the texting and you know all that that we do. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> like come back around. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Do you? So we talk about right, like the concerns that people have had with Chatbot. Um, sorry, not Chatbot. Chat GPT. Um, is what other benefits? Like, so I know we like circled around to like you know our assessment process might be different now, and like communication could come back. Are there other benefits from it? I, I think creativity is can be amplified enormously. Like um, innovation is iteration. Like mm -hmm. you, can, you can actually map innovation by how quickly you can iterate. And the, and there's the massive problem of zero to one. You know the blank page syndrome. Yeah. The problem of I'm, I don't know where to start. Right. And and so like I saw in this capability kind of the ability to go. For, you never have a blank page. Like yeah. why would you have a blank page? Just ask it to get started, and you have something to go from. Right. So I, that's a huge benefit to me. To me that is already available. Now it needs to be productionized, mm -hmm. right? And, into, and I'm not sure how they're gonna 
like this is just a trial service right now, right? Yeah. But these large language models, what it's illustrating to me is these large language models can play a very important role in helping us go more quickly to meaningful conversation, to meaningful iteration. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Oh my gosh. You like said my favorite word ever, which is iteration. Miss Liz for not being able to hear it. Um, <laughs> she would have loved it, but I, I mean, even from the design world and human centered design, right? We have templates about all of the different testing that we do with users um, for research. Um, I came from a visual design background. So right. Just to make my process faster, to get to the creative, more fun stuff. I had so many templates, mm-hmm. right? Like if it's outputting social media graphics, I don't want to spend whatever time it was to remake those size, relook up whatever the sizes are. Like I want to get into making the, the creative right. artifacts. Right. Um, so it is, it's like that right. for a programmer, on, for example, like right yeah. now you can get the template code from, from that, not just chat GPT, but there's others that GitHub has a code, yeah. code co- co-pilot as well. There's that, that's showing up lots of places, but wow, that's amazing. I don't have to, there's a lot of time wasted effectively going and just putting templates together. Yeah. Right. And get to thinking about how to actually make this work, work well. And then actually have time to think about the design. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, I, I, lately the past 10, 15 years, we've seen better even human user interfaces. Mm-hmm. There are some terrible ones built and there's still terrible ones built. If you're just engineering centered only, yeah. like you really do need to like, how is this going to be used by people? Yeah. I and think then, there's more time for that. Yeah. Especially right. Like if we have like a static homepage layout already or like the different components, right? Like now I can focus on what is my user's actual problem instead of like, let me recreate all of this. Yes. And although it's not like overly stimulating brain work, right? It still, it takes time out of the day. It's still, right, it was still brain work that's not being used um, to address other problems in innovative ways. Uh, do you have any thoughts on it too? Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I think we, <laughs> I think we covered the areas that I've been thinking as well, where it's, you know, it acts as a prompt where um, like you're saying the zero to one game, you know, that uh, for anybody, you know, in that millennial age group, you know, that SpongeBob joke where he spends 15 minutes writing the word the, you know, and the rest of it's uh, totally blank. Um, it's like, I'm done. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, I don't, you know, as I'm starting a new project or something, it's like, Oh, what's the code to, you know, pull down something from S3 FS or what do I, what do I, how do yeah. I get my stuff out of uh, the Azure blob store? It's uh, you know, I have to go and find that on stack overflow and then I copy paste. That's, there's no critical thinking that happens yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> you know, right. It's like, I, I need to be worried about my model architecture, what I'm, how I'm building my features, things of that nature. And uh, you know, using something like this to create a quick code snippet, you know, it's going to be really similar. And that's why also it's kind of raised the alarms for Google where, you know, now they're like, we have to invest heavily into AI and ML because chat GPT is extremely powerful. And, um, it, well, they have been, I mean, they've been, they have their own language language models, but I think, I think it showed that the user interface, maybe they had to rethink how they were thinking of bringing that to market. Like they've got, you know, deep mind, they've got, they've got a lot of, Mm-hmm. AI projects and TensorFlow exists yeah. because Google was doing this a long time ago, but so are everybody else, so are other people, yeah. right? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Google adjusts because I agree with you. It does put at risk there. Like I look at 90% of what I use Google for, yeah. I could use one of these large language models easily yeah. and yeah. be and, and easier, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've got to go and get on it like after this. <laughs> I'm like so tempted now because just like exploring how you said, like depending on how you put the input you can get like different results. And yeah, well you could, you could try something like just give it the questions you asked us. Yeah. And then replay like, and then see and replay and see, yeah. and see like, Oh man, it was about like, maybe it's even better than, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like, you know, you might go, were we talking yeah, about? I'll just like erase them and put an <laughs> avatar and then have chat GPT tell me this episode. Just have a voiceover artist <laughs> have a voice, yeah. I mean, it, my, my guess, it probably won't be, exactly like that but you'll find that it's actually pretty good yeah like giving you reasonable sound reasonable statements and somewhat insightful yeah. and people have a role in like you know providing new you know innovation creativity like you was mentioning earlier where it's uh you know it's providing a really solid foundation that you can build on and um it's uh yeah it's i think it's cool <laughs> yeah no it is cool i think though we won't ever be replaced on market though. You yeah. can't get our silly jokes from chat GBT. Well, <laughs> or does I, it I actually? Know. I don't know. I haven't tried asking. I haven't gotten on there and asked it anything, but I'll maybe ask it for a joke sometime. See what happens. Yeah, in comparison to Alexa's, yeah. she gives you. No, it's actually, it's much. Yeah. It's, it's 
Alexis will be replaced with something like a Jarvis. Like I, yeah. this is the word I'm using because it's a little more, a little more, you know, like more recognizable, yeah. and I can give you more. I can give you more. Like, yeah. oh, I think you meant to say this, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to just doing exactly what you said. <laughs> or sometimes she just gives you the complete wrong. Yes. Thing. Yes. <laughs> You're like, what? Yes. Yes. What's going on with that? Um, so, you know, when we're looking to advance society in using AI machine learning algorithms, you know, um, typically those are around, you know, helping people, human centered metrics, things of that nature. Um, so when you're looking at building and researching new solutions or applications to AI and, and ML, what are some things that I guess um, are, are common like checkpoints it, that we're there, looking for? It really is important to have the end to end solution in mind. I think you, you've got it, call it end to end testing. Um, <laughs> You, you can't do it immediately. Like typically you have to break it apart into several segments. I'm going to do my model and train it and have it have a testing regime that I'm doing. That's pretty standard, but it like immediately you've got to say, is this actually getting me to where I'm trying to be? And how do I test that? What's my testing scenario that is human centered? Yeah. Like, what's like, my human centered yeah. testing scenario? Like that's really important so that you don't end up with, Oh, declaring success when you actually don't have anything that's useful. Right. In, in a lot of ways, these large language models have just now gotten to the point where they're like, oh, this is something we could actually use. You know, they've, they've been OK. You know, they've shown, you know, they could do a lot of things like translate uh, from one language to another. Like we've seen that already. Uh, things like Alexa, they could respond to our voice and give us to like, be a replacement for typing in a Google search. But now all of a sudden, wait, this is a really valuable thing. Actually, what chat GPT doing is interesting. They've actually released this beta to the world. Mm -hmm. And they're essentially getting us all to test it for them, <laughs> right? So they're gamifying us, right? As we talk about how cool it is, you're going, oh, I'm going to go type some stuff in. Out, and so yeah. you go do, and they're thinking, thank you very much. I'll get some more. Take more I'll data. take more data. <laughs> as to, and you know, what they're looking at is what kind of questions are being asked? What kind of, uh, you know, what kind of, how, how, how are they repeated? You know, does it, is there repeat questions? The, the cool thing about ChatGPT is there's a session, actually. You can ask it a question and ask it a follow-up question. It maintains state. Oh, cool. you've actually, you're actually changing the model you're talking to in that session. And so you can, you know, you, you can say, reword that for me, please. What do you mean by this word you said? And it'll actually have a conversation with you. It's not just a single answer. It's actually a, a story, you know, kind of a consistency you can do it. You can, you can do with it. It's learning from all that. And it's, yeah. it's using that to train the next version. That's crazy. It is kind of crazy though. So, you know, in some sense I'm like, yeah, they're, they're pretty smart. <laughs> but that's so how we do that. Like think about how do you do something similar when you've got a problem? Mm -hmm. Can I get my users to enjoy um, training the model further with me, right? Rather than having a miserable experience with yeah. it, right? Can you go, well, let's see, does it solve one problem that's helpful a little bit? Uh, you know, if it can solve a small problem for somebody and then you can get data to help solve a bigger, I think that's a really important approach. Don't try to solve the big problem all at once. You know, see if there's a part of it you can do that they're going to enjoy the training process. You know, they'll enjoy doing the testing with you. Is Would that help tie into, right, like, there's a lot of, like, um, right, all this AI ML can be, like, really scary and it's going to take over the world or be, like, that Disney smart house where the smart house, like, made itself a person and, like, locked the family inside. Um, how do you help, you know, everyday people become more comfortable with it, build trust in it? Um, yeah, we, we've got our minds full of a lot of um, science fiction around AI yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the future won't look like that. It'll look different. And actually, to me, what, what I realized, like, I guess I thought social that Netflix show about the social the, the mm -hmm. networking. Yeah. How, actually, it's dumb AI that's hurting us more than smart AI. It's yeah. not because AI has become intelligent it's because we have not done a very good job of using AI. Right. We've been using it to game a system that's actually not hurting our children mm -hmm. because it's the attention spans decreasing because we're basically addicting ourselves to a very particular kind of feedback loop. Yeah. That's the problem. It's because we're using it in a, inappropriately. So it's not like we're not going to have that's that's a, that's a long time away before the AIs become conscious. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, some people argue that there's 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 some that exist already like that. I, I don't think that's the, what's what's happening. But what what's happening is we're getting really good models. And there's a segment and, and so how do we use those models? How do we, um, I think engagement is, is the key, like making sure that you have end to end engagement. It's not, you don't segment the world. Okay. Here's my model. And then here's this black box. You guys just have to use it. And we're in, no, we're not going to take your feedback. No, we're actually looking for how do I get your feedback? How do I get you involved in the process okay. so that you're kind of involving 
you know, it's hard, of course, because the more people you involve in a process, the more bottlenecking you get and the, and the less scale you get. So you have to find, that's really the, the secret is to find that interface, that API for of engagement where you can get another group of people giving you meaningful information like, oh, I like this or I didn't like this and then and update it from there. I think the more we get familiar with the different aspects, like we'll, we're going to see AI everywhere. We already do to a degree. I mean, your spell checkers yeah. are ML. Like, and today, like, that's kind of become pretty commonplace. Yeah. People are, you know, the Grammarly and spell check is everywhere. My kids have it in their doc in their documents. Yeah. I think it'll be like that. Like it'll be sort of show up in all of our, like it'll be a tool in our house. It'll be a tool on our computers. So I think we'll start to become familiar, but I think the room, the, the stories will still be out there. Um, and there are things to pay attention to, but usually it's not what you're, what, what has been already told. It's the stuff that hasn't been told. So don't know how to prepare for that. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's keep cool. talking. <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> we'll get there. No, I love it. I like getting right. This, like you said, we are filled with a lot of the sci-fi, like the like scariness of it. It's nice. Like I feel like this whole episode, we've talked about the actual positive benefits, and that right, you re look at what you're doing rather than you know block it from people's computers because you're scared of what it, the negative impact. Um, instead of Right. Maybe we come around and do other things that then have a positive impact on a skill that we've been missing. Right. Um, this technology is always scary, right? Like I know right? like, I work at weird. a tech company and I'm like the slowest adapter to things. <laughs> I'm like, uh huh. You, you go try that for a while. You let me know how that worked out. Well, I think we have to remember that, that hu- it, it is human time scales that technology technology doesn't take over as rapidly as we think because mm-hmm. humans are involved and humans don't shift that quickly. Right. It, and it's, yeah. 20 it's a generational thing right so that's why i say it's going to take a while because ultimately people are going to do what they're used to doing and they'll adopt things that help them that make life less painful for them Mm -hmm. and that's what they're going to adopt they're not going to be forced into doing something but the challenge is oh we're getting really good at learning how people experience you know pleasure and pain and then we can actually manipulate them right we don't that's do that the problem is all of yeah. a sudden that's to me been the most dystopian aspect is oh our our machines have actually started to learn models for manipulating humans and that's not great no. and there's a lot of temptation for that and and it's not that's the biggest challenge and there's there, there's some things like that that are absolutely real so it is a we do have to be vigilant but not panicked and it's okay. not the things you think about it's actually just just know where you know know your supply chain know what okay i'm using chat this is cool but who makes this yeah like who, where's this model running who's receiving this information that i'm giving it where's it going and what are they doing with it and if something's free to me if i'm not paying for it somebody's paying for it and Somehow. i'm the product right yeah. yeah so am i okay with that those are the things you have to be asking because you are the product if you they're using your data mm-hmm. to make something better and maybe you don't want that to happen yeah so were you going to say something? I feel like you're like, I'm just always, checks and balances? always shifting. No, it's uh, <laughs> checks and balances. So <laughs> we don't get taken over. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's at the end of the day, you know, responsible use is we were just talking about is extremely important because, you know, the, the opportunity of machines and or machine learning is very, very high. Like anybody had seen the Boston dynamics, you know, dancing robots, that's insane. Um, I thought it was fake when I first saw it. I was like, oh, that's a cute little computer generated thing. And then I studied the video. And I was like, they They've, did not computer generate this. You know? <laughs> They've really figured out how to make the joints of a, of a robot move to mimic the way humans do. And it is, yeah. uh, it is outstanding. And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's about, you know, applying that properly. And so, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, maybe people are put in less high risk scenarios? Like, you know, if we were able to, um, have these robots go into burning buildings and like carry people out. That would be mm-hmm. outstanding. Uh, you know, there, there are positive and negative ways to apply technology every day. Um, and what we have to do as Travis mentioned is be vigilant in how we allow that technology to impact us. You know, we want to ensure that we aren't building algorithms that heavily weight success on anger generated from a <laughs> post, you know, uh, these are, these are all things that, uh, you know, we understand as people are bad, but if we just let an algorithm run unchecked just based off of, you know, what generates the positive, the, the response that we're looking for, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we have to kind of go back and, you know, test and evaluate and ensure 
that what we're doing is good for the people that we're working with. And because at the end of the day, we're all part of a society, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've all got to help each other here. Um, and we want to ensure that we're, we're all working towards a common good. Um, you know, maybe I got a little too, uh, I don't know, happy, uh, you know, shiny green space kind of thing there. I don't know the best word for it. Hippie, <laughs> hippie kind of hippie, thing. Hippie, no, love it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess to wrap up the episode, right, to say happy, um, what are your hopes for the future of AI, ML, and the open source community? Yeah. So one of my big hopes is that, uh, again, education and people learn mm -hmm. again, not that everybody's an expert on how to deep tra train a GPU model and knows about CUDA programming and that, that no, not, I don't, that don't need to happen, but a few people need to do that, but everybody should at least understand kind of what an AI is just like they understand what a human is like, mm -hmm. and, and that it's a thing that's a, it's a model that's not perfect. It's based on what it was trained with and so knowing how it was trained is important mm -hmm. because it'll only be able to produce what it was trained on. And so I think we need, we need people to ask good questions, you know, good questions of the models they're using and to be good consumers of AI, right? So uh, intelligent consumers of AI, you want to be asking the questions of what you're, what you're getting, not just blindly using things and going, Oh, somebody smart must have thought through this. <laughs> the, pro the reality is, yeah, probably somebody smart was doing something, but not necessarily thinking of you in mind, yeah. <laughs> not thinking of your interests in mind. They were thinking of something else. So you need to take, and then, you know, I think both individually and then collectively, as you gather with groups and organizations you're a part of, you can collectively help each other consume AI better. It's going to be there. It's an, mm -hmm. It'll be awesome, actually. I think it'll get rid of a lot of mundane tasks. It'll help us actually enjoy life better. I think there's a lot of questions it brings up in terms of, oh, how do we, if we're to enjoy life, then you know, when I was little, I thought, gosh, if we're so successful and prosperous, maybe we only have to work 10 hours a week. Yeah, right, because right? all those other Because all these tasks. other stuff is done, done, so maybe yeah. we can. That's not really materialized because we keep getting more and stuff to do, but, <laughs> but yet at some sense, as a society, we're actually probably wealthy enough that if it was, if the, if the resources were spread out a little bit better, mm -hmm. that could happen. Like what's happening now is it's not, we're concentrating in the hands of a few more and more resources. And there's a lot of people who don't, the divide is growing. Maybe we can use AI models to help us solve some of those problems and actually do a yeah. better job of, of market allocations. And, but the answer there is not going to be the big sky net in the sky, right? That is just unleashed and we let it run. Like <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to be, uh, again, we have to be good consumers and good stewards of our AI technology and models. Awesome. Wilson, do you have any hopes for it? Hopes and dreams? No, I mean, um, that's, a, I've been a big advocate for a long time around just general education on these areas. Cause you know, a lot of people look at machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science as, you know, oh, it's all magic. I'm not even going to try to understand it because I don't think I can. But at the end of the day, humans created all of this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so of course it can be understood by humans. So I've tried to encourage a lot of my friends that are even just curious about it. You know, even if you don't want to go all the way in and learn, you know, the linear algebra and how, you know, that works in the back propagation of neural networks, you don't have to understand things like that. But if, if you just want to, you know, have some fun, poke around some tutorials and learn some of the basic math that kind of underlie all of this. Uh, you know, I have friends that work in like business supply chain and uh, the friend that I mentioned in biotechnology, mm -hmm. he's just researching machine learning on the side for fun. Um, you don't have to go to grad school or anything like that to start to learn about these things. So I'm hoping that that trend continues where people are able to go out and discover and learn new things. Uh, Cause that's how I got started was, uh, you know, just going out and finding some yeah. cool stuff, you know, uh, and learn about it. So uh, that's really my main hope. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I really like about data science in general. Yeah, that's cool. It'd be a very interesting world if, right, like learning all that becomes like people's hobbies. Like you were talking about, like, like I'm a really big gardener, but like, whatever I throw doing some of this, I don't know. Sounds really intimidating yeah. to me right Learn now. Some but yeah. Learn some it's Python. Learn some Python. It's just python some stitching some function calls together. Actually, <laughs> you can be using a model and building one too. Yeah. It really is accessible. Yeah. Learn 3D printing and just you know have it just learn to go and drop like your broccoli seeds in exactly the right place. Oh, now we're talking. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Let's <laughs> get my whole robot out there too. <laughs> go flick off all those hornworms on the tomato plants. That's oh yeah, that'd be interesting actually. Yeah. There you Lots go. of things. Um, God, I'm so good at bringing gardening into episodes. <laughs> um, 
Thank you so much, Travis, for being on today's episode. I really enjoyed it um, and all the topics that we covered. Um, so where can everyone find you? Oh, great. It was awesome to be here. Marie, thank you so much. Um, they can find me on Twitter at TE Oliphant. They can also find me, uh, they can find us at www.openteams.com, www.quansite.com, and on LinkedIn. And just ping me. Uh, I love to talk about AI. I love to help people learn. i um, really excited by anybody who's interested. There's several episodes out there. I had an episode with Peter Wang, my co-founder, on ChatGPT just a few weeks ago. So you can probably find that on the interweb as well. Awesome. Wilson? Thank cool. you for co-hosting today. It's wonderful to again. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. And then we have hot jobs here at MetroStar for AI ML. Um, we are currently hiring for an AI ML lead, a principal AI engineer, a data engineer, um, mid to senior level, a data scientist, um, mid to senior level. And then as well as Travis is going to continue to hang out with us today and Wilson will continue chatting with him later um, in our Pi Data event that is a hybrid in person and virtual. So there will be a streaming um, recap that you can catch and linked in our show notes. Well, uh, you know, this was Mock It. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share with your friends, and join us next time. If you're interested in learning more about how government and tech collide, visit metrostar.com and follow along on socials.